Hello, everybody. This is Open Lab, Kuna and Open Lab seminar, um, the last one in this spring series uh, in spring 2022. And our um, um, prestigious guest is Professor Frank Schweitzer from ETH, from ETH in Zurich. He's the professor for chair of systems design, and uh, he will talk about cultural data analytics, the bigger picture. We're always in for that uh, because that's sort of also what we're trying to. Uh, work on here in this lab. And as you will also see, this is the second talk that actually happens in person at Tallinn University. Um, and uh, that is probably also the reason why we struggle with techno technical problems, which we will definitely promise that we won't have in fall. I will give the stage to Frank Schweitzer. Uh, I can also turn in the discussion the camera around to, so you can actually see the audience who's present. As you can see, we're about 50-50. Uh, uh, part of the group is remote um, in Austria, in uh, Lithuania, in um, different other places, and we also got guests from Zurich, so we're very happy to have you here, and finally have this working, and I think we count the two hours from now on. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot uh, for the kind invitation, Max, and for the kind introduction. I'm very glad to be here, so we already talked a little bit about the work of the lab, and I'm curious to learn more after my talk. Um, so, what am I going to present to you? The bigger picture means to convince you about some methods that you may not have used before. So, I'm not going into details here. I'm providing a glimpse of an overview. So, that's the introductory slide of our share. So, I decided to not present any details here. If you're interested in our work, please go to our <laughs> website and take a look at our various publications in different directions. We are a bit the outsiders to cultural dynamics. We are physicists, mathematicians, political scientists, social scientists, engineers, uh, and computer scientists. None of us is really a historian or a cultural uh, scientist. But we have adopted uh, quite some topics of uh, with an interface to cultural science, to history, and I'm going to present some results of these uh, research areas today. The first uh, research area I want to mention is a project on the European Reformation. That's the doctoral thesis of Ramona Roller, and I'm very happy that Ramona also joins. Uh, the talk and can probably uh, add a few comments later. What kind of data do we use to study the European Reformation? So first of all, this was a social and political movement in the 16th century that basically revamped the whole uh, uh, structure of the European countries. We have uh, Data so, um, there is uh, data available from letter databases of protagonists of this European Reformation, starting from Melanchthon to Luther and Bullinger and other people. So in Total, we talk about nine different letter editions that we have access to over a period of 65 years from the beginning to the late um, 16th century. In total, we have access to 26 different letters, mainly the media, uh, metadata, and this covers about 3,000 people. We use the metadata from these correspondence to reconstruct uh, the social networks of the reformators and to quantify their impact. I will give a few uh, details later. Why is this of interest? One of the questions that are, is also studied in the thesis of Ramona, and there's a nice preprint available, is the issue of confessionalization. Why did uh, uh, German territories change their confession in the beginning of in the, uh, in the course of the 16th century? You see here uh, uh, that 
uh, in the beginning, everything is red. If you look into the map of the Holy Roman Empire, because everyone was uh, uh, followed the Catholic uh, religion. And then you see that over time, uh, territories adopted Protestantism. Question is why did this happen? But these all religious people believing in subtleties of religious discussions or what was it? Was this the influence of the reformators? Was this thanks to Luther who started this whole uh, social movement? Was this the presence of certain uh, uh, high profile representants of uh, the reformation? That's one of the questions that we wanna answer. And in order to do this, we have to do a lot of operationalization. We have to estimate how we measure impact of people, what is the influence of neighborhood, what is uh, the uh, measurement of political power of neighborhood relations and so forth. I recommend to take a look into the paper of uh, Ramona that's available on SAC archive. So, <clears throat> It's a challenging question if you look here into this uh, second picture um, to estimate from this type of structure, which lists certain uh, prominent figures of the Reformation and the latter correspondence, this um, influence on the Reformation. The second project I want to talk about is a research project on the Swiss parliament. Uh, <clears throat> there we have access to all of the documents uh, of the Swiss Parliament. I'm talking about about 167, 68 years of parliamentary history in Switzerland. This, these documents are accessible, but they first need to be digitized. This was partially done, then they need to be uh, screened for their content, and then we have to create a large knowledge graph in order to understand how certain political issues are, late, uh, uh, are linked together. Uh, this project is led by uh, Laurence Brandenberger, who works uh, as a postdoc, and there is Sophia Schlosser, who is doing her PhD thesis on this topic. And there's also a collaboration with the Swiss Data Science Center, because the Swiss Data Science Center helps us to uh, prepare these documents and to make them accessible for a database. I come to this in a moment. So what are the different problems that we are, want to address today when we start from this type of data or documents that you have available. The first problem is how to get the documents in the database. We all know that documents exist. They are in state archives and libraries and so forth. But we have no clear view of how many of these documents exist. We also have no clear view of uh, what is their precise content. If you look here, then you see a letter of uh, Heinrich Bullinger, one of the uh, most important reformators uh, in Switzerland and Zurich. So people have collected all letters that Bullinger wrote and uh, received. We're talking about 10,000 of letters. They look pretty much like this. So we have access to these letters. But would this help you to do anything with it? You are unable to read it, so someone has to transcribe this for you. And even then, if you have a transcript of it, it's very difficult to get the bigger picture from these uh, letters here. This is one of the issues. When we go to the parliament, and of course, we have all the documents that are OCR, but they are not prepared uh, to make the content accessible. So in some sense, we have an information overload. We have lots of documents, but we have no real um, ability to squeeze out information from this document. The second problem that I see is the question, uh, the, the problem of the right research question. In 
At the beginning of February, we organized a little conference in Heidelberg where we invited those maintainers who have these large letter editions. In, uh, in Germany, there are quite a number of important letter editions that uh, these are projects that run for 30 or 40 years. So people try to transcribe the existing letters, they put this in databases, and then they show out their content. But what we also have seen in this uh, conference, so Max also participated there, that people don't really know what to do with this. No? They have all the nice letters and they have keywords for it and who sent it and when was it received. and. Hopefully they have this type of data, but they don't know what to, what to address. In many cases, we see descriptive studies that someone says, okay, what did Bullinger say on this very specific theological question? And then there's a list of letters and a list of arguments and so forth. These are very typical. What we are missing is a systemic view where we have different letter uh, databases linked together. That's something people are working on. There is a project at the Berlin Brandenburgische Akademie der Wissenschaften who tries to set this up already, but there are no large scale studies. And the third problem that I also see is that we lack tools and techniques to access uh, then definitely the content. First and foremost, we need to have an approach to deal with incomplete information. We don't have all the information available and we will never have all the information. Question is, what do we miss if we have not all the information available, right? So you can answer this question only with a statistical approach and this has to be developed. Right? The second thing is to get to a bigger picture, we have to, connect the isolated dots, which are, for instance, the isolated reformatives, in order to get a more comprehensive uh, representation of the discussions, uh, for example, that happened uh, during these times or the discussions that happened inside the Swiss parliament. And in order to get to this point, we need a transdisciplinary knowledge transfer. It is important that those people who are able to read the Bullinger letters and then make a nice summary of it can talk to a computer scientist to tell what they have to be really uh, attentive to and what are the difficulties if you want to deal with these things. It's, from my personal experience, it's very, very difficult to have this interdisciplinary discussion. No, I can refer to my own experience uh, with the theological faculty of the University of Zurich, for example, who was responsible for this Bullinger edition and many things like this. There is definitely a lack. Good. I try to now explain in a few more words uh, how this problem from documents to data look like. If we go to the Swiss Parliament and to the documents available, then we have printed documents that look like the picture here on the left hand side. So you see different type of headlines, you see two column structure, you see one column structure, everything is mixed together. So it means the first thing, if we want to do an OCR is we need to discover the structure of these documents. And the structure is not constant. This structure changes about every year. And then there are hundreds of other documents that are as relevant and have a completely different structure. So it means in, before we are able to access the text content of these documents, we need to guess how the structure of these documents look. This requires a machine learning approach and this together with this uh, data science center. What we want to get in the end is a graph that you see on the right hand side. That's a knowledge graph that links content in this type of network. Uh, I come to this in a moment. 
So this is a closer view of the data that we have available from the Swiss parliament. So we are talking about 170 years. We have access to the most complete <laughs> records of any parliament. So there are longer records, for example, uh, ordered from the US, but they are not as detailed uh, as the ones that we have available here. So you see here three different types of documents. So the most important one is the Amtliches Bulletin, where you see we're talking about 35,000 different documents and in total more than 200,000 uh, pages, right? And each of these pages has this type of structure that we first need to get. And if we make mistake, then we put the wrong things together, right? So in the middle, you see then the summary document where I talk about 19,000 uh, pages that are linked to the Amplity Bulletin, but this needs to be discovered in what ways of these are additional information. And then we have these protocols. So you see that the pile of documents that first need to be uh, uh, structured here. The project that we do together with this uh, Swiss Data Science Center contains of these three work packages. We focus here on the first work package first. So then uh, the most important challenge in the beginning was to extract information about the structure. And only after we have a clear uh, recognition uh, by means of tools from uh, 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 natural language processing, only then we can start looking into the OCR text and then try to uh, uh, link different topics together. We want then in the uh, second phase, take the content of this um, of these documents and do some language and topic modeling. These are all tools related to uh, natural language processing. And in order to do this, we need to solve a number of problems, most know about the issue of name entity disambiguation, which is a very tricky thing uh, to get this. Code. We need accuracy in the screening of these documents that are far above 95% of correct. So we are at 98 at the moment. So you can imagine what this means if uh, you have uh, 210,000 uh, different documents. Our aim in the end is to build a sort of knowledge graph, which I would like to describe uh, in the following a bit better. This knowledge graph is a database. So I'm sure that you are also uh, I'm allowed with these concepts also thanks to the work of uh, Maximilian Schich. This graph database connects different entities that are colored here in the picture on the right hand side, uh, in different uh, colors here. So these entities in the example of the uh, Swiss parliament here are the members of the parliament. There are other entities, their speeches. There are other entities, the bills that they support and write together with others that then become laws and so we see different type of relations. If you zoom in here, then you see, okay, what are uh, the different relations here? Someone has proposed the bill, someone else has uh, uh, sponsored the bill, that means they co-signed the bill. Uh, someone else gave a speech on the issue related to the bill in the parliament and so forth. So that means there are very different uh, relations here. We have labels uh, for each of these entities. For example, what is the party, the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 member of the parliament uh, relates to what is the date uh, when a given uh, issue was discussed in the parliament and so forth. We can use this type of graph database that we are constantly uh, uh, evolving then to look into specific topics. So here is one example of a Swiss politician who was important around the beginning of the 20th century. So he became a Nationalrat, which is uh, uh, a, a member of the uh, Swiss parliament, of the 
large chamber, and later he became a Bundesrat, which means a member of the government. He was a representative of the Canton of Geneva, and he belonged to the Liberal Party. And what you we see here on the right hand side is Mr. Ardor in the middle, and then you see different uh, speeches he gave on different issues and uh, different activities he was involved in. I'm not going into the detail, but this is a type of network which is person central. And then we can ask questions. So how did he promote certain ideas of his liberal parties in the parliament? How did it diffuse uh, from his speech at the so-and-so date uh, in other discussions and so forth? We can also discuss, uh, for example, what was the role of Switzerland in World War I, where Mr. Ador was uh, uh, a member of the Swiss government. Uh, so he was involved in um, uh, founding the Red Cross and this type of thing. So we can study a lot of uh, political issues by focusing on these activities. But we go to a larger picture here. This is just a snapshot for a few years, 91 to 95. Then you see different members of parliament the red dots, you see their speeches um, that they gave on certain topics. You see their interventions of the bills that they proposed and you see all the links who supported whom and what was the contribution of individual people. And I'm not going into the details. What you see, there are two clusters here. This is a, these are the two chambers of the Swiss Parliament. Uh, Stendorat is a smaller chamber, and the Nationalrat is a larger chamber. So this is our major aim to get to into uh, um, a structured, a graph database like this. What is the advantage if we go for a graph database? I illustrate this here with some information that uh, I got from Luis uh, Salamanca from the Swiss Data Science Center. You're all familiar with SQL databases. Yeah, you have these tables created, and then you have rows that we refer to entities, and then you have columns that refer to attributes. And if you have these relations, then you have to encode this in some way in an attribute and so forth. You want to change something because later you find more other information that should be included. So you know that this becomes very difficult. You have to recreate this thing. tables and so forth. In the graph database, in the Neo4j database, things work differently from the outset because from the beginning on, you have these different forms uh, of entities, relations, labels, and attributes that. Um, uh, are handled separately. So that means if you want to extend this database, there is a very easy way of doing it and it also scales efficiently. That means if the database becomes larger, it still becomes handleable. I illustrate this here with a simple example where you count the neighborhood of people in a social network. That's an artificial example. Let's assume we have a social network of 1 million people, and we want to know uh, how many friends a certain person has. So that means we pick a person at random, then we count the number of friends. This is our first order neighborhood. And then we are interested, what are the friends of the friends? That means we count from this person the second order neighborhood, the friends of these friends, Third order neighborhood is the friends of the friends of the friends. So we, we are basically exploring the network structure starting from a given individual. Yeah, very clear. So we go up to order five. Yeah, friends of friends of friends of friends. Yeah, we explore the network. We do this for 1,000 times to get an idea about the network structure. And if you look into uh, my SQL database, how much time it takes to do this quite simple query, then you see that uh, the friends of the friends uh, can be done in less than a second, then the third order already takes 30 seconds, uh, the fourth order takes uh, more than 20 minutes, and the fifth order takes more than one. 
for a very simple <coughs> you go for a neo for j data set, and you see first order or second order takes less than a second but fifth order takes two seconds that's a very efficient way of querying databases yeah. uh, <clears throat> so that means once we have this uh, uh, database available then we can do very efficient analysis we can use graph algorithms to explore these networks we can have nice ways of visualizations i just showed you here a few examples and we can in particular do topic modeling it means we look into where are different topics uh, represented what keywords are used to represent these topics how did the uh, relevance of this topic change over time. And so forth. So, there are lots of things uh, that we are planning to do with this type of database. Yeah. Now I come to the second point. Let's assume we have this data available. Now we need to come to networks that we can analyze. What we have is the knowledge graph that you see on the top right. Uh, here with the different entities and their relations and the different colors indicate here different entities. This cannot be easily analyzed as a knowledge graph. What we have to do is we have to project this knowledge graph. There are so-called bipartite <coughs> projections that we can do. If you look into the middle row, let's think of the uh, blue dots here at the members of the parliament and the yellow uh, squares here as the topics they address in their speeches. And then we can use a projection out of this bipartite network. Every member of the parliament who talks about the same topic gets a link. Right, so that's then the social connection. It's our common interest in the same topic. That's why we get the link. That means we can project, uh, we can project then a social network out. We can also project a topic network out of this. We can say, okay, if this one member of the parliament talks about these two topics, then maybe these topics are linked together. So let's put a topic map here and a link indicates that people commonly address these two topics together and so forth. So what we get when we do this projection, we get a multi-layer network. A multi-layer network means that I have different layers and each of these layers has different nodes. This can be the speeches, this can be the persons, this can be the topics, this can be the builds, whatever is available. And then we have links within this layer, how are topics connected, how are members of parliament connect, and we have links between these layers, as we indicated here, which members of the parliament address which topics, so support which bills and so forth. We have tools available to study these type of multi-layer networks. I just cite one book here where different of my colleagues have made contributions uh, formal for the formal description of these multi-layer networks. What we usually analyze is the so-called multiplex network. A multiplex network is different from a multi-layer network in that the nodes in each of the levels is the same, but their relations are different. So that means we are always talking about the same members of parliament in each of the layer, but sometimes we talk about their collaboration in a, uh, a given committee, and sometimes we talk about their uh, interaction uh, with uh, party members and so forth. Yeah? So one should not mix these two things up. What we are really interested in is the multi-layer network and the multi-layer network has different nodes and features. Good, so now let's assume that we have created these type of networks. I take the reformators here. <coughs> I took their letter correspondence and whenever Reformator A sent a letter to Reformator B. I assume that there is a social relation, and then I put a link here. So 
means I'm not studying the letters. I'm studying who connects to whom via the letter. That's expressed here. And I do hope that everyone sees the people here that are important. Let's zoom them in. So this, uh, here, this is Luther, this is Ulrich Zwingli, this is Melanchthon, Erasmus, Calvin, and Bullinger. So, <clears throat> you see from this picture already, Bullinger and Melanchthon connect the dots, right? So you see already in this sketch that I just made by hand that they seem to be a bit more important. Good. So now we understand that we can get this type of social network from the letters. But I'm not interested in this picture. I represent this picture with the nice faces at the network in the middle where I have the dots named A, B, C, and D. And then I just look into the structure. That means a topological connection between nodes, nodes A, B, C, and D. This is a very strong assumption, actually. It's a provocation for the social scientists. Because what this move from the left to the middle picture means is it is sufficient to study this topological structure to learn something about reformation. And then the historian says, no, no way, right? So you have to read the letter, you have to follow the arguments, and so forth. And we say, Let's, let's start with this. Let's find out whether there's something useful, something novel that we can discover from these type of stuff. Yeah. This is called network influence. We try to learn from the network structure something about the individuals that are represented in the structure by means of the nodes and values. Yeah, I hope that everyone gets this point. So if you don't buy this transition, then this talk will be very difficult. So in fact, I also don't care about the middle picture. I care about the right picture. I represent this topological structure as a matrix. And this matrix contains who is connected to who. And what I do later is, I studied the properties of this matrix. That's a very, very huge abstraction. Yeah? Let me come to the detail. <clears throat> so here we have one example where these networks of reformators that we are also interested in became uh, of interest to a larger audience. In 2017, Germany celebrated 500 years of the uh, uh, Reformation that started in 1517. And then uh, there were nice um, exhibitions, three nice exhibitions by the German government. We talked about exhibitions yesterday, so whether the curators care about the public or not. So these curators cared a lot about the public, a very good exhibition. So I've seen all of them. And they try to represent this letter correspondence network here. So we can look here in the middle, we see Philip Melancha, and then we see a few other faces. Already from this picture, you see what the problem is. These are stars, yeah, stars like a network structure. There's a dot in the middle, and then you see these connections to output. But so these stars are almost not connected, right? And here we see this big halo. Can you see this? Of letters that Melanchthon sent to other people. But we don't know how these people were connected to each other, so therefore it looks a little bit like this. So these were not unimportant people, but right? it's just that we don't know how they were connected. That's why they looked like this halo. Yeah? So <clears throat> what people do or did so far is they focused on the so-called ego networks. I also have another example here of uh, the correspondence of Gottfried von Leibniz. It's a project that's done in Göttingen. And then you see here uh, the different, uh, the different uh, locations where 
correspondence was sent to or was received uh, uh, by Leibniz. So this is one of the pictures where people try to, to show some network structure of that. Uh, but because everything is centered on Leipzig, uh, on Leibniz, we will only see these type of star-like structures. The same is true for Luther. You see here the Luther uh, correspondence network. But um, um, so we, we can deduce some activity by Luther. We can uh, also point to certain regions where Luther tried to have some influence or wherever he was located, but we cannot learn a lot. Now, if we take the bigger picture and do not focus on Luther, we focus on all reformators and on all letters, so then we get a picture like this. I show you the small video, which we created here. It gives us the time from 1500 to 1565. 1565 is the death of Heinrich Bullinger, yeah? So, and you see in the beginning, of course, there was nothing. And then you see that uh, very slowly a network <clears throat> uh, between these reformators and other people that are present in the database is uh, showing up, which can be analyzed. The different colors, as you see here, point to the different uh, roles of these people in the networks. So we have arist uh, aristocrats here, we have uh, theologists, printers, uh, humanists, and other people. Yeah, the, this is a kind of visualization that we get if we try to deal with about 20,000 letters instead of, uh, instead of just, one. Here's another example from the Swiss Parliament. We put everything together, then we see that we can represent the structure of the Swiss Parliament in a similar way. You can clearly see that there are groups uh, in the Swiss Parliament. They are related not to directly to parties, but uh, to uh, political. Uh, convictions. Uh, Switzerland has about seven parties. What you recognize here are six, uh, four or three different clusters, yeah? because the parties are not really independent. We have these type of patterns that we extract from the documents, and we can ask, um, for example, about polarization. How does this increase over time when where the uh, polarization going down, for example, during World War II, we could see that there's less polarization. So conclusion for us is if we have these networks and I have shown how we get this, so we can possibly do a number of useful analysis on this level, even that I don't go into the details. What can we do specifically? Here are a few hints of what we can do if we have these networks. What we usually do, what everyone is doing, is we look into the topology that is the aggregated structure. We put all letters together, we create this nice video, the network becomes denser, denser, and denser. Why? Because over time, we have more data available. And then we take this aggregated network and for example, look into the importance of people, into structures like who's in the core, who's in the periphery, is the network connected? We have seen so that there are sometimes these big halos of isolated people. Why are they isolated? Because we don't have the documents that link them to the rest of the world. So they were never isolated, right? It's only the data uh, that looks like this. Or we can look into community sports. Here's one way of quantifying relations. So we, these are so-called motives. Social scientists are interested in reciprocity. Reciprocity means 
If I do you a favor, will you do me a favor afterwards? If I write a letter to you, will you respond afterwards? This is direct reciprocity. Indirect reciprocity means I do you a favor, you do him a favor, he does me a favor. So we have then these cycles. So, uh, <clears throat> um, this is, for example, interesting in the Swiss parliament. Everyone would expect that direct reciprocity is obvious, right? I support your political project. Why? Because last time you supported mine. But indirect reciprocity is first very difficult to detect. These cycles are not as small as here. So they can involve more than uh, three individuals. And uh, then it's also not really clear what does, for example, J gets in turn for supporting K. Right? So that's a not very obvious thing. By the way, the same reciprocity picture applies also to scientists citing each other's work. Right? Just mentioned this here. Right? We can look into triadic closure. So that means, do we see closed triangles? That means, so if uh, here in our example, uh, uh, person one is connected to person four and three, then the question is, how likely is it that person three and four also get to know each other, maybe thanks to person one. And so, forth. so these triangles can be measured in social networks and they can be classified. So this uh, so-called so clustering coefficient that measures the local clustering. So how many of my friends are connected? That's a local clustering coefficient or the global clustering <laughs> coefficient, how many of all people form these closed tribes. This is a very important uh, sociological signal, as well, you know, which always pay, gets the attention of social science. We can look into quantifying importance. I mentioned these different centrality measures. Degree centrality is very easy. It simply means how many connections does someone have? And then we try to interpret this as important, right? So how many, so who has the most connections in a group of scientists? So the secretary, right? So because the secretary has to talk to everyone and has to send emails to everyone, right? So that means the degree centrality detects the secretary as the most important person. Yeah, so you already see, okay, well, probably we make a mistake if we just go with this. There's closest centrality. It means how many steps does it take before I reach someone else? Those people that uh, are very close to other people then play a, a larger role in closest centrality. Uh, <clears throat> eigenvector centrality means how many people uh, uh, are connected to other important people. That's also uh, 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 measurement so professors are connected to professors and then probably get a larger eigenvector center. And between the centrality means uh, who is on a path between any two agents. You know? so who controls the flow of uh, information between any two agents. If they have a direct link, of course, no one controls the flow, but most of the time, there are indirect links, many hubs. And then the question is who is on the middle of most of these paths? That's between the centrality. We can look into community structures. You see here that uh, in particular social networks are uh, uh, form, form these clusters here um, that represent uh, different social groups here. We also have uh, this, uh, core periphery structure that you see on the right-hand side. This is very typical for social networks. We have a quite densely connected core, and then we have a large halo that is not directly connected to the one. A network analysis would simply drop this halo, but you already understand what's the mistake that we are doing if we just drop all these individuals from the analysis that are not connected to the center. I come to this later. We can talk about assertivity. Assertivity 
addresses an important question, namely, are important members of this group, are, uh, are they connected to other important members? Or are they not connected to other important members? Yeah. So <clears throat> you can imagine that the president of, uh, of uh, country A and the president of country B are probably not connected to each other. They are connected via other people, right? So, and this is reflected in a measure like assertivity. It's important, so the important people know each other and are connected. So this is uh, like in ce celebrity environments, so this plays a role. Uh, <clears throat> but there are other environments where this does not happen. And this usually indicates some sort of hierarchical relation. Good. Yeah. In friendship networks, we usually see that um, um, these networks are assortative, whereas in political networks, although in firm networks, we see that the network is dissortative. Samsung does not collaborate with Toshiba, Samsung collaborates with uh, a number of smaller startups, right? So, and, uh, not directly with its uh, important competitor. Good, so then we can address the question of gatekeeping. So who is, if we see this uh, uh, community structure, who is then connecting these different communities? This was addressed in social science for a long time already. So Rana Vetter wrote his paper on the strengths of small tasks. So, that means so the people that are connecting these clusters are important in transferring information that does not exist inside the cluster. So the question is who plays this role in the parliament, for example? Yeah, I, who connects these different party-centered clusters? Who are these individuals? That's a very important question. We can also address this for the uh, Lutheran Reformation. So here we look into a nice picture that uh, Christoph uh, Gode has prepared uh, just recently. And we I'll just zoom in here. We see different colors that identify different communities. So this was done automatically. It's not that we read the letter and assigned then the people to different communities. This was done in an automated uh, procedure. And then we can look into how these different communities are connected. And we can identify those people that play the role in connecting these communities. And the most important connector here is the lunchtime. He is not shown here because he's connected to everyone on this slide. Yeah? So Melanchthon was the gatekeeper of the Reformation, similar to Heinrich Bullinger in uh, Zürich. And this type of analysis can be done. Good. Now I convince you, hopefully, that we can look into a lot of interesting features. And all of them seem to be interpreted. That's good news, but now we need to understand the limitations of what we have to If you just apply everything that I have shown you so far, you get results, you can write nice papers, but you are not doing the analysis. And that's why I named the talk the bigger pitch, because now I come to all the limitations that are involved when we do it as I have described. The first most important thing is we need to understand how we get to these networks. And the problem is that there is no network. I show you a little animation of a real data set. So you see a number of individuals, I think 100 or something. That's their communication. You see a network? You don't see now, you see activities, right? So the bursting activities, that's what you see. Huh? Then there's the weekend, activity goes down, blah, 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 and so forth. Yeah? So you understand what the problem is. There is no network. The network is a reconstruction of the data in a very specific way. 
And what we need to do is we need to understand what is the mistake that we are doing if we take our data and treat it like a network, right? So understand network reconstruction, what I write here on the slide, is the most overlooked problem in networks. That's for sure. Yeah? So 90% of the people doing network analysis do not understand this point. The first thing that we have to look into is what is the role of this causal relations? And the second one is what is random in this interaction and what bears a meaning, right? And I will address this in the following. So let's look first into the temporal aspect. You see here in picture A, a small communication pattern. There are individuals A, B, C, D, and E. And you see A talks to C here, and C afterwards talks to D. D would not get the information if A had not talked to C, right? Because there's no link from A to D, and so forth. You can see how this pattern looks like. If we just plot the links between nodes, then we get this picture here. That's our network picture. A talks to C. And so forth, so from the picture on, the, on that side. But this is, tells us from the structure that obviously there is communication from A to C to uh, E possible, there is communication from B to C and D possible, and even though that this communication never happened. This is because we took this aggregated network work. In fact, how the communication looks like is shown on the, on the lower part in the path. A can only influence D, while C and B can only influence E. This is not reflected in the aggregated network model. So it means by drawing our conclusion from the network in B, as we did so far, gives us a big mistake. Here I try to tell how we can cope with this problem. You see two interaction data sets on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. They give us the same aggregated network, which we call the first order network. So that means if I go through this data set and count how often did A talk to B, how often did talk B talk to C and so forth, so then I get this picture. And this picture is the same for the two data sets on the left and the right. Only the sequence of interaction is reshuffled between the data sets. The total number of interaction is the same. So that means the first order network is the same for these two data sets. But the second order network tells us about the difference in these, um, uh, uh, in these interaction structures. What is the second order network? The second order network takes the links between A and B as a new node, and the links between B and C as a new node. So that means instead of taking the former nodes, I have now a new type of node, a second order node that takes two nodes together with the links. And then this three tells me that I had first an interaction from A to B, and then an interaction from B to C, namely three times. Yeah, this is true for this data set, but not for this, where it is only two times. So it means by looking into a higher order network, or in this case, a second order network, I understand what is the influence of the way of communication, the path of communication. Yeah. Question, where does this play a role? That's important. We can calculate the centrality measure that I have introduced before between the centrality, eigenvector centrality, closeness centrality, and uh, <clears throat> uh, degree centrality, these four. Yeah, we can calculate this on the aggregated network and we do this. So this is, you see here on the left-hand side, our real world social network. And then you see, we calculated the uh, important values for each of these individuals and 
we find out that individual, according to all of these uh, centrality measures, is the most important individual. We go and look into our team and see, okay, so that's number 19, the person in the front row who always tries to give influence and impact to the discussion. Good. Now we take the second order network. The second order network reflects the communication part, the real communication. And then we see the most important person is number 15. So, and number 15 is not the person who always sits in the first row and tries to be very important looking. No, the person who is really important is the person on the back. So you understand from this, that's, that's a real world data. Yeah? You understand from this type of analysis that we can do big mistakes when we do not understand how we got to this. We can quantify this mistake by uh, using a measure that we have introduced. It's called betweenness preference. If betweenness preference, you can calculate this. I'm not going into detail. If betweenness preference is low, it means for you, we don't make a big mistake by taking the aggregated value. If betweenness preference is high, then it means we are making a huge mistake. We have developed a software path pipe together with Ingo Scholtes and his group, which is also available. And uh, th there are these measures like between this preference are already implemented. It means you do not need to start from scratch reading the papers, implementing the Python code yourself. So this is all done for you. You just need to remember there is a measure that gives us uh, an idea about the mistake. Next step, where does it play a role, this temporal order? Ingo made a nice example for me where we looked into the Wikipedia data set. People had to navigate in Wikipedia, but that was a, not, not the whole Wikipedia, but was a subset of Wikipedia. And they were monitored in the number of steps that they had, had to take in order to get a certain information. That's recorded in this Wikipedia data set. So, and here you see, so from the clicks that they uh, did, this type of network. Yeah? So a link between Denmark and Norway means that you first were on a page relating to Denmark, and then from there you went to a page related to Norway. And so forth. So that's our typical first order uh, network that we get, our aggregated network. Would, where a link simply means I navigated from this page to the other page. So what can be the topic of this is something with history, right? So not very clear. So, so we can see that. And now, now we take the second part of that. Now, the second order network gives us clusters. And we see that these clusters have a very clear meaning. Yes? So this has to do with war. This has to do with uh, mythology. This has to do uh, with ancient uh, history. This has to do with medieval history. This has to do with, uh, 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 with uh, Nordic uh, uh, politics and so Interesting, right? So the same data set included much more richer information about the topic that these people were interested in. We just need to find a way to squeeze this out. And this is what we show here. So that's why higher order networks are important. That means we are able to detect a semantic context that we cannot see in the first order network and simply looking into this other type of network construction. Next point. Now we talk about the importance of the links that we see. The problem that we have all the time when we talk about historical networks, there's only one, right? So we don't have 10 observations of the same type of network. We only have one observation. So. And then we see a link, right? Between you and you. What does this tell us? 
Is this link there just by chance, or is this link there because there is some importance yeah, in the relation between these people? And then we see that there is no link between this person and this person. What does it mean? What? There is no link. Does it mean that this person never interacted, uh, that there were some unfriendly relations? What, what's the meaning of an absent link? Maybe there was simply no data that uh, is available to record it, and these people interacted a lot. Remember the beginning when I showed you these ego networks, which were the star-like networks, right? So then you see that, uh, of course, lots of links to the focal node, which is the center of the star-like network, but there are no links within these uh, uh, people that, that <coughs> form the uh, relations to the star. And so it's a spokes in some sense. Yeah. So, and this has to do not with the unimportance of the people, this has to do with the situation of our data. Now the question is, what can we do with this one observation that we have to create possible networks that are compatible with what we observe, but probably tell us a bit more of what we are missing. And this moves us to the topic of the network ensemble. So what we do now is, we create a whole set of possible networks that are all compatible with our real world observation. <clears throat> and then study this network ensemble. This is what we do. Yeah, so the network ensemble contains all possible networks that uh, we can get by a certain procedure that I will also describe. So of course we have boundary conditions. These boundary conditions are reflected in the network ensemble. If you were born much later uh, and uh, when, when I was already dead, so then of course the network ensemble cannot create a link between the two of us or these type of things. So this can be encoded in uh, additional information or boundary conditions. <clears throat> so the question is now, how do we get to these uh, network ensembles and what can we draw in terms of information from it? That's the only slide with an equation here. I thought for once you should see how it looks like yeah? if we create a network ensemble. The network ensemble is a probability distribution. AR means probability. So that's the probability to have the observed network, which we call G, provided that I have some boundary conditions, some preferences that I have detected. So how does the uh, network, uh, this equation look like? Do you see there's ARJ? This is the adjacency matrix. You remember the slide where I showed you the black dots and said, okay, I'm only interested in this matrix. That's the adjacency matrix everywhere where I have an observed link. There was this black dot and that's written in this matrix. This matrix uh, psi here gives me the, all the possibilities to link two nodes I and G. If you have a degree of five and you have a degree of four, then you have 20 possible ways to connect this to it's simply ki times kj yeah so then the most important thing is this omega the omegas are called propensities and the propensities i encode additional information i have a preference to interact with you for whatever reason right and this preference uh, biases the structure of the network <clears throat> there is a way of, doing, uh, of calculating this. It's called a multilayer network regression. I'm not going into the details. You have an R package available by developed by John Akasiragi, which helps you to estimate these propensity. So basically what we do is we have this multilayer network that we have talked before. And then we are trying 
to use additional information about our friendship, about our location, about our common history, about our party membership, whatever is available, and put this into the different layers. And then we can regress from these different layers, the uh, omegas, which is a bias to talk to you instead of you, right? So that's, that's the omega. And the more information we have, the more we can constrain this thing. Yeah, <clears throat> good. So that means now we have produced a multitude of possible networks that reflect the boundary conditions of the real network, but can be potentially possible. And the first thing that we can ask ourselves is, how large is this ensemble? If this ensemble is very large, then it means there are almost no constraints in our interaction. Everyone can interact with everyone. There are no real preferences. And so, forth. so we try to quantify this in one measure that's called potentiality. So you can calculate this if you have a very large number, like for this social network, that's a so-called Southern woman data set. Then you know these Southern women, they went to their cocktail parties in all possible combinations, right? So there's no real preference. If you see a low number here, these are participants of a conference, then it's very clear that there are constraints that do not allow all of these participants to interact freely with us. There are people with specific topics, it's computer science conference, if I remember. So, and they were of, talk, of course preferentially talking to other colleagues that had similar topics. And so, yeah? so that means I can already calculate what is the flexibility or the adaptability for these types of networks? The next step that I can do when I have this network ensemble, I can tell what is uh, significant and what is not significant. We call something uh, not significant if it can appear at random. That means if I have my network ensemble, I see a lot, a number of links that are appearing there and have not been there before, then I can ask myself, okay, I can ask myself, uh, <clears throat> does this link have a social meaning or is this link appearing at random? If the link can appear at random, then it's not, a social relation because the definition of a social relation for us is, is it does not appear at random. You know? If I get a data set about passenger mobility and I see two passengers together uh, so then in, in one train, so then I can ask myself, okay, is this just by chance because they use the same train every morning or are these colleagues that meet in the train to discuss certain things? So, this uh, type of question can be answered by looking into the network. So that means the important thing is, so what we want to do is different or deviations, measuring deviations from randomness and only this deviation from randomness basically allow us to give um, uh, an interpretation in the social manner. So then, of course, if we have detected these social relations, then we say, well, we have to include this into our network ensemble because this is now not a random interaction. It bears a social meaning. So therefore, it shapes the, com con uh, the uh, com complete network ensemble. So that means we add new constraints to the network ensemble and do this in an iterative way. And this happens as long uh, as we have an additional information available and the network ensemble becomes smaller and smaller. 
That means most of the things that can happen at random are excluded in this process. Where does it play a role? For example, when we want to detect communities, this is again a real world data set. So from 94 individuals, um, so that belong to different groups. So we have the full network here in this adjacency matrix. You see the, on the two top uh, and left row, you see these 94 individuals, and then you see the different links that they have. And the more often they interacted, the darker the color. That's the data that we have. Now the question is, how much of this data can be explained by random interaction? So we calculate our ensemble and we find out that this many interactions, namely uh, about uh, 80% of these interactions are not significant and therefore can be explained at random. And only these 626 uh, links have been identified as significant links. And all the other links that we have seen from these 3,000 links could just happen at random. The two of us walk out of the same door. The two of us meet uh, just by chance in the entrance of the Mensa and so forth. Yeah? So this has an impact if I want to study communities. Look at the lower part here on the left-hand side. You see there are clearly three communities and we can even look into the colors and then interpret them as class memberships and so forth. So, but once we remove the uh, insignificant links that can happen at random, the community structure looks much more complex. So what does this picture tell us compared to the picture with the three communities? that there are many more subtleties to structure the social relations than just the class membership. Yeah? The community picture on the right side is mainly driven by class membership. And everyone would conclude, okay, class membership explains the situation, but that's not true. Most of the observations that we have are random observations. Last point, coming from um, coming from interactions to social relations. What is a social relation? A social relation is something that builds up over time and usually has a sign. That's what we call the sign relation. So interaction can happen randomly. It doesn't have a particular, uh, it may have a particular bias, but not a particular direction. <clears throat> so, the question is, how can we identify sign relationships? This is very difficult. You and me are enemies, right? We don't interact. We don't have records in our data set about our interactions. So now we have the question, okay, there is no interaction recorded. Is this because these people don't like each other and don't try to talk to each other? Or is this simply an uh, artifact of the data set? That we have missing data. That's an important question. In order to solve this problem, we use again this uh, hypergeometric ensemble to generate the network. We need uh, more additional information. So the assumption here is uh, if we have a positive relationship, then usually there is more interaction between the two of us. So we are friends, so we interact more. That's the underlying assumption. Now the critical question is what means more, right? So I see there are some pairs of nodes where I don't have a lot of interaction. I have some pairs of nodes that have a lot of interaction, but I don't know how much should these nodes interact? This means that I have to generate a hypothesis about the possible interaction. And this is described here on this slide. I'm not going into the detail. So you have here 
two agents two and three right and you have a probability distribution and this here is the observed number of interaction it's 10 here and then we use additional information about the community to find out that the expected uh, number of interactions should be six so that means these two guys interact much more than what we would expect from this network ensemble. Therefore, we deduce these have a positive relationship. We create a so-called friend of foe index uh, that is in these cases positive. I can also, by means of this uh, additional information, extract then information that if I observe, for example, in only two interactions, so then I can say, well, so I had to expect six, but in fact, I only see, see two or three interactions. So then I can conclude that these two people do not interact as much as it. Where does this problem play a role? In the parliament? In science, I write a paper in your field. I can expect that you recognize this paper. I can expect that you cite this paper, right? But you don't do. You cite other people much more than you should, right? So there are five papers from this famous network scientists that are cited, even if they have nothing to do with the subject, right? But my important paper, right? So you completely leave out. This is not uh, the exception, this is the rule. Yeah? We are discussing in Scientomagic, we are discussing citation clubs where people have formal agreements of how much they cite each other and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, activities. So, this is a matrix that tells you about this relationship. The friend of four index is blue if we interact much more than expected, and it's red if we interact much less than expected. So, this can be calculated. On the x axis here, you see real names. I made it as small as possible that no one can read it, but we use this to check basically our own community. Yeah? This is our own data. To find out whether this type of method makes sense. So <clears throat> what we see here is we can, if we have this interaction data available, if we have a uh, ensemble that allows us to generate expectations about interaction, if we have additional information, uh, social information, then we can calculate these type of indexes. And of course, we can also apply this to the parliament. This is not the very last picture here, but we are working in this direction. And then we can find out about the friends and enemies in the parliament. So this picture tells me in this study that the strongest supporters are, of course, from my own party and what the strongest enemy are from the other part. Good, so that would be expected. But now, now we focus into more details. We focus into pairs of parliament. And then we see a very different picture. Then we see that you and me belong to different parties, but still, I support you more than what this picture would uh, tell me, and you support me more than what this picture would tell me. Right? So that means, so then I can identify what are the two people that basically do the work across parties. What are the enemies inside the own party that then get a very high negative friend or foe index because they support me much less than they should do, yeah? or the members in my own department or whatever, right? So you can use different examples. Good, last slide is about hypothesis testing. If we can all do this, so then 
we can also try to infer what are the driving forces behind the social structures that we see in the net. Here we took one example, uh, again, the real world data from these 94 individuals. These are uh, from high school classes. So they are, have identified themselves uh, as uh, being in different classes. So that means we have this information about class membership. So we have seen that they have unique interactions. So not everyone with everyone, but uh, we have 213 unique interactions. But so many of these pairs interact much more than once. Yeah, 1,500 repeated interactions. And now I ask myself, what explains the social structures that I see? There can be this social relation. Social relation means the number of links that uh, pairs, uh, uh, that uh, nodes have. It can be friendship. This would mean triadic closure is the factor that uh, explains one. Or it can be simply the group membership. So that means the class label. So we, the, the social structure that we see here on the top right can be explained basically by knowing the membership of the class. And now we use our different methods and draw conclusions. So we use a standard method from exponential random graph models. We apply this. So exponential random graph models can only deal with uh, or can preferably deal with unweighted networks. So that means there are no uh, repeated interactions. And we use our own ensemble uh, that can capture repeated interactions. What we found out is then that the community structure, that means the group interaction the membership is more important than the friendship interaction. And what is so? And what is the reason for this? The reason is that repeated interactions matter more than what the ERGM model reflects, basically. So, conclusion: If I use the wrong ensemble, the wrong network ensemble, I come to the wrong conclusions, right? It does not mean that I cannot publish this paper. Yeah? Of course, these papers are published, okay? But the method, the limited method that I apply to test the hypothesis leads me to wrong conclusion. That's a message, message here. So, whereas if I have more advanced tools available like uh, the Jihad Ensemble, if I can estimate propensities from this network regression and the force, if I can all, do, can I do all this, what I have shown you today? So then I'm also able to look into established data set and come to a completely wrong, a completely different conclusion. So, so, namely that in our case, the driving force is really the class membership and not the French, which was the <laughs> conclusion before. So what did I try to sell today? I, pointed to different problems. So the first problem is how do we get from date from documents to data? This was the discussion of how to treat documents with respect to their form, to their content in order to get a Neo4j database. And then how do I treat this data in the database to get to a network? And I pointed to the most important problem, namely to understand what we do when we construct the network. We can do ample sorts of mistakes and are not aware of this. So I mentioned this uh, case of measuring importance that we identified the wrong people uh, as important because we use uh, limited methods. The second problem that I try to address is the issue of random versus meaningful. I have only one observation and have, we have no clue of whether this is on purpose or just on chance. Therefore, we need to generate network ensembles. 
And we need to incorporate in these network ensembles as much additional information as possible. And there is one network ensemble that allows us to do this. It's a GHAL ensemble that allows to consider these preferences or propensities. These are biases in interaction. So this network ensemble allows us also to generate expectations. What should be expected from, from this type of data? And then, only then, if we have the expectation, then we can uh, measure deviations from this expectation. And these deviations from the expectation, they are called social, right? So that's social. Social is what is not expected at random. That's the point. And the last thing is I made a difference between interactions and relations. Interactions can happen by chance and are then recorded, but in order to understand what social relations means, we have to uh, try to identify the sign of this relation. We have one method here, the print of four index that allows us to generate hypothesis about this sign and then calculate this uh, difference. In conclusion, what we can do is if we have this data available and we have a good command of all these tools and techniques, uh, we can do quite a lot to read out this data. But at the same time, we have the challenge to sell all what we have found then to the rest of the community. That's the community of the historians and the politicians and the political scientists, but that's all the community of our network scientists colleagues who do not know about these ensembles or do not believe in this type of method. Yeah? So I'm here to trying to convince you that you might be interested in this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. So I think the best way to, uh, to discuss is probably uh, by people in the room who have a question coming up here, because here is the microphone. Um, and then Frank stays in the picture, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody on Zoom, um, I can already see two hands raised. Um, so I will <coughs> change the picture. So we basically, let me do this right now. So basically we will have um, something like this going on. So we can actually see who's there in the picture, maybe small. So you can see there's two questions by Yuna and Tosphir. Um, and so thank you very much first. So this was a, a wild cavalcade in one could say three different areas. One, cultural data analytics with knowledge graphs. And I, I think it's a, a great news. This was a thing I, I was doing very alone in 2005 to 2010, except for Google, which is approximately yeah. Back then was there where we are right now, which is sort of cool. Um, so we can catch up. Then the second area of the cavalcade is uh, basically the area of network science. So today, thank you very much. This was probably the most succinct overview we have ever heard in this group um, of all the different things that are relevant to network science plus where the, this is really the cutting edge, right? So this is really uh, where this is going. And then one can also say that you're very strongly representing what is in the broadest sense called social network analysis, which has been its own field, has a conference that's just as large as this. So there's plenty of questions. We have about half an hour uh, to discuss because we started 15 minutes late. And I just um, would ask um, maybe, let's take one person in the room first who has a question. Nobody? So then let's start with uh, the units in my teeth online. And I think you can just speak up and uh, we should hear it. Uh, all right, let's try it. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Ah, great. Well, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. It really covered so many aspects and I can see so much applicability to the work that we do here at Kudan. Um, I mostly work with uh, social networks uh, in uh, film production, but now also expanding to the networks of board membership, uh, mostly in screen media industries. Mm, but we also have a project that uh, colleague Mila Oiva leads on uh, newsreels, Soviet newsreels, and how people were collaborating to shoot those newsreels. 
In that project, we have a historical data set that spans over around 50 years. Um, and we do build social networks based on collaboration. But at the, at the moment, we are only looking at the network overall, at this aggregated network. Um, so I was thinking about that project when you were discussing um, temporal networks, um, the temporal analysis. And in there, you were making this distinction between the aggregate network and uh, a second order network and how you can make mistakes when inferring uh, the centrality or the importance of people in the networks. But I was actually wondering in practical terms, um, how would you really uh, construct this second order network? Um, and also when you look at the temporal um, evolution of a network, how are those time periods selected uh, when you have uh, data spanning over many years where you, for example, in our case, we know the year of collaboration when that happened. So maybe you could talk a bit more about that. Thank you. Good, yeah. Very good point. Uh, so let me start with the problems that you addressed, namely uh, selecting the right time window. Yeah? So that's indeed a real issue. So. Um, the assumption here was that the uh, time resolution is given in the data. Yeah? So, um, so it looks a little bit like uh, on the slide here, we have discrete time. And um, so in each time step, uh, the information propagates from one node to another node. Yeah? So that's more or less the assumption here. This is not always true. Therefore, detecting the time window is a problem by itself. So we are all working on this uh, by entropy maximization methods and so forth. The only thing that you can do is you have to try with different resolutions to find out what is the impact. If you have only yearly data, it will become very complicated. Yeah? It's probably not... Uh, um, the right way then to deal with temporal networks. But if you have communication data, like with email communication, where you have very precise timestamps, or with uh, uh, other type of chat rooms or this type of data, though, then it makes a lot of sense to think of temporal networks. Well, if we have the annual data available, as we have for firm networks, for example, then we just use sliding windows. Uh, sliding time windows. So we did not really test uh, 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 temporal network uh, and second order networks. Can I, can um, I ask a follow maybe, Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just uh, I was also then just wondering how to actually go from this first order to the second order network. Maybe you could explain that again. Uh, okay, good. Can... Yeah. So we can look here at the example on the slide. So let's take here. So. So this is time going down and we have four nodes A, B, C, D and you see that on time step one, node A is um, interacting with node B. So information arrives at time step two at node B and then at time step uh, node, uh, at time step three from node B to node three, yeah, you see this. So this is represented here in the first order network. There's a link from A to B and there's a link from B to C, yeah. So, in total, in this uh, whole data set, there are 12 times a message passed on from A to B, and six times a message passed on from B to C. This is how I get the first order network, okay? So now I come to the second order network. I say, well, maybe so. this is my new node now. Yeah, so that's an event. So this is A, B. So there is probably also, so we don't have uh, AC here, uh, but we have, so BC is also a new node. And then we have also, um, yeah, uh, okay. And then we have CA, so it's somewhere here. Yeah, this is CA, so this is also a new, a new event. Yeah, you see them here, that's these events make new nodes now. And then I, look into how often was the message passed on uh, in this sequence. That's now a sequence from A to B, <laughs> and then from B to C, that's a sequence, yeah? And then maybe, so this is another sequence uh, from B to C and from C to A, yeah? So you see these are different, uh, different, uh, 
communication part. Yeah, no, thank you very much. It's much clearer okay. now. It's sort of a okay. concatenation. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, in this PathPy uh, software, this is all implemented. If you have the data available to this and you define the time resolution correctly, then you get the second order network as an output. Yeah, you don't need to do this by hand. Yeah. yeah. I have a follow-up question, so thank you very much. So we met uh, last fall in, at Darkstool with uh, plenty of specialists in higher order networks. And there were sort of, there were three groups of people. The ones who were more interested in cliques and uh, simplicial complexes, the people who were more interested in hypergraphs, one could discuss this also. But these two formed one group one we could say more complicated higher order network sciences and the other one uh, strong group was actually focusing on getting these second order yep, uh, yep. interactions from temporal structure yep. so now this is at the same time I, I think wonderful because it's sort of like does this thing where we go from substance individuals to function meaning the interaction so here what we have is a network of interactions interactions of interactions so to yeah, speak yeah. now one of the key questions that the other group uh, which I, I sort of could say belong myself uh, would ask is how about true higher order interactions like for example in somatic uh, uh, um, yeah. connections like you know i invite frank and frank starts talking with you and you and frank write a paper yeah. so without the enzyme wouldn't happen this is something you don't capture right so how how, well, how we, do you deal with the higher so order? This is no no we, we can go we can go to any order k okay. here, as long as we have passed. I'm glad that Christoph Goethe is uh, here present. Also, so Christoph has written many uh, uh, papers on uh, these higher order uh, network construction. Mm -hmm. There is uh, other recent paper on a technique Mojin. You, know, you can check it out on website. Uh, quite technical paper, I have to admit, mm -hmm. uh, where we try to also predict where this will end, okay. this type of path. Yeah? Okay. So that's um, that's an uh, important topic. So now we are able to capture different orders as long as the data allows us. Yeah? Okay. There is a different thing that also relates to this is group interaction. Mm -hmm. That's what we do now. Yeah. So we would not form a network because we are all interacting together here. So we should be represented as a group instead of uh, a combination of two nodes each. So that would be a fully connected cluster. Mm -hmm. There's the group interaction also belongs to this topic of higher order networks. Mm -hmm. So where we try to identify larger, larger groups uh, or larger clusters mm -hmm. with, which uh, interact in, simultaneously together right so that's another topic yeah in higher order networks nice tasvir uh hello can you hear me yes yeah uh thank you frank for such a nice and wonderful talk uh i have uh, uh, very few uh one two question uh, that you talked that uh, you are dealing with the knowledge graph so how you define this as a knowledge graph? Because uh, one example that you quoted that uh, it was the data from the Swiss parliament documents and then documents were transcripted and then they were, uh, 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 then the respective uh, represented in the form of graphs or, or and then uh, processing was done on top of that. Uh, if I talk about uh, my uh, my PhD background, I have worked in the graph convolution neural network. So I have a background of uh, graph convolution and things like this. And I want to ask that how the these knowledge graphs, they are different from the simple graph or how these knowledge graphs, they are different from the scene graphs. So this is uh, the thing that I want to listen from you and how, uh, how your, your take or your opinion about it. Thank you. Uh, so again, that they are different from the scene graph. Or... Scene, so scene graphs are, are, are graphs that are uh, in, in image description. Uh -huh. Basically, it's it's basically like a, a, like what you do from written documents. Yeah, you yeah. Create some graphs. Imagine that with an image, basically. Uh -huh, good. So I'm not very from. So no, <laughs> I mean, so the knowledge graph is, is simply a, another term of a. Uh, uh, 
uh, graph database, in our case, NAO4j database. It's a representation of a, of a database here. And uh, uh, as I said, so we have these different types uh, of uh, entries there. We have, yeah, we have entries, we have attributes, we have labels, and we have relations here that can be uh, specified here. Um, in order to get to the normal or what is called simple graph, I assume. So I was talking about these projections here on this slide. Could you agree to this? Yeah, so here on top, we have the knowledge graph and then uh, we try to represent the knowledge graph as a multi-layer graph where there are links within one layer. That means links between persons, for example, or links between topics, but also links across layers. So persons talking about topics and so forth. So that means each of these layers could be described as what you call a simple graph and probably uh, so, but we have to uh, look into the interaction of these different layers and this is related to the topic of multi-layer networks or interconnected networks. Does this somehow answer your question? We can discuss more, I guess. Um, I, 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 I like this idea that like what, what, what the, the direction that you and Ramona are going in this uh, case, because in digital humanities, there is this sequence of sort of you go from the document, you recognize text, OCR it, and then you do entity recognition, you create graphs and stuff like this. But one of the interesting things is that we're actually bathing already in these kind of knowledge graphs, like any relational database, any database, anything that has multiple colors of things on it. Uh, can be sort of like understood that way. And as you know, I'm, I have this disease uh, going on since about 15 years that I always try to map these graphs in their entirety. And uh, one of the big questions is always, why does Max do this? Um, there have been funny names called on it. Um, one of the reasons that is, if you go to one of your networks with a lot of stars, for example, you can pull up one of these slides. Uh, one of the interesting things is, that the advantages you are actually mentioning for a knowledge graph, these really low query times that you can do walks really quickly because you have your nodes identified, they are not really possible if you don't have a full map of the knowledge graph because what you do is the majority of the time you hit one of these degree one nodes and then you always go through Melanchthon yeah. and your query is fairly yeah, boring, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the big challenges, and this is sort of called to the community is I think we need to map more of these graphs because we can do a lot more things other than just social networks, even though they're a big problem. I think yeah. that's a big yeah, issue. Good. I mean, what, what we need to understand is how to analyze knowledge graphs. So, and mm -hmm. so on this slide, I try to give you a hint of how we possibly see this. So the knowledge graph by itself can be queried. So we <laughs> can put entities together and so forth. But uh, I mentioned here on one, uh, in this picture, there is also, so graph queries is clear. So what we, we can, basically query the database, but there is analytics and there are graph algorithms. So that means we can squeeze out more of the topology, but for this, we need to have these projections that I was talking about, yeah? So our major, our major aim here is in this uh, graph analytics stuff, yeah? mm -hmm. um, the next one, I think, is Antonina. You had her hand up without raising the electronic hand. Uh, so, Antonina, go ahead. And then we have Mike in the room, and then there's Viuna uh, uh, online. Sorry. Yes, Antonina. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a speech student, and I'm only in the beginning of learning about networks. So, currently, I'm taking a course uh, with uh, Tila Gross. So, uh, and I have a question for you. I think it's a pretty basic question and you explained it, but could you please explain it again? Like how do you filter significant links from insignificant? Nice. Good awesome follow up. Thank you a lot. <laughs> Thank you for so the question. So let me, so are we here? Here, the 43, maybe? So this, 40, 43 is like the next slide, I think. Yes. This one. Can we use this one or the previous one? This one or this one? Okay. Anyway, so 
So the first thing, the, if we have this data available and we have constructed the network, then the first question we need to ask is, uh, what of this observable structure can be explained at random? Yeah, so in order to explain something at random, I need a model. So I'm not sure, do you know any network model? Do you know a random network model probably? Yeah, you have heard of uh, Erdos Schwaini network or these type of things. Yeah, so that means I take two nodes and with a certain probability, I link these two nodes. This gives me a structure that's called a random network. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. that, so, and then I have, I have other type of models and try to generate networks from these. And then I get link structures. And then I put my observed network and my randomly generated network next to each other. I mean, all of my gen randomly generated. And I ask, so what is this specific link telling me? Can this appear at random? And when I see so that in my network ensemble, all the time this links appears without putting any info additional information in this, then I can say, well, this link can be explained at random because a random network model always generates this link. Mm -hmm. But if I don't see this link, then I say, well, so I have a random network model and so never I see this one link. So there must be something else and randomness that basically mm -hmm. creates this type of link because in the random network, I don't see the link. And this, so then, of course, I have to build, that's what I also said here in the iterative structure, I have to build in more and more constraints for this network to get uh, the model more realistic. And then by this uh, iterative procedure, I squeeze out more and more of these random explanations. And then in the end, yeah, in the, where we never will be, yeah, but in the end, then we have a model that only generates a very few realizations. And all of them basically come, uh, can not be explained at one point, yeah? because we have used additional information to characterize this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, does it make sense for you? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for the explanation. Yeah, welcome. Can you, can you make a difference between significant links and significant interactions happening due to random links. Let me give you an example. Yeah. You, um, I was standing in the hallway of a library uh, waiting for a friend going for lunch and randomly this other person passed by which I also knew and I said, hey Kai, yeah. this is yeah. Eva. Good. Yeah. Um, Hi Eva, do you, you want to join us for lunch? We went to lunch and it's like they're now married and have two kids. This was a random interaction. Yeah. Um, the fact that if I pass by at 12 p.m. is yeah. you know, not, not really something significant. But obviously, this was a very important link. If you go to your next slide, uh, one can extend the question to these insignificant links. How can you exclude all these random links from the fact that they are all they may be consequential and even more, much more important than the ones that are significant for the future of the system because yeah, every future good. of a system yeah, is yeah. specific. So now the treating network models like this would uh, stretch uh, these models way too far. Okay. Yeah? These are no causal. These are no causal explanations. Okay. Right. So so this can <coughs> this so in, in, in my course I tell people okay well this helps us to focus our attention on certain features, mm, right? Okay. So this is the only thing that we can do. Yeah? If, uh, <clears throat> if I start with the simple random network model and I already see the same distribution of friendship links as I would see in my real network, mm -hmm. I would say, well, so friendship is nothing social. Friendship is something random, right? So because the simple model already gives me the same distribution. Mm -hmm. This is not true, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so random networks have a zero uh, uh, clustering coefficient for us. Uh, social network have a high clustering coefficient. So then I have to say, well, so look, this network ensemble has something missing, right? So because it, it's not able to generate us friendship. 
So what is the next assumption that I need in order to get to this? And then I add a new constraint to the random network model to mm -hmm. get my triangles right. So, mm -hmm. And then the other features, yeah, reciprocity. And then people say, well, let's put in another constraint here. And then this way we are getting away from the simple network model to the more complex network models. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we have uh, then ideally, as I said, a set of possible candidates that all match our empirical uh, observation, although uh, <clears throat> they have not been observed, but they could have been potentially observed, yeah? Mm -hmm. so. Okay, first of all, I'm sorry for, for yeah, being covered yeah. because, yeah. because I have a slight cough and, yeah. and just to, to, to uh, actually I have, can I be seen? Okay, <laughs> true. Uh, 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 basically, I had several questions, and I was hoping yeah. that some people will ask some of them. Yeah. So, thank, thank you, the unit was. Uh, I, I, and, and thank you, Antonina, because, because I actually wanted to 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 follow up on on exactly this slide now. So, am I right to understand what you just said? That in your model here, you already have them separated into classes. No, I use the information to detect this uh, insignificant links. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that I mean, that, yeah. that model which, which separates significant and insignificant already has information about classes. Yes. And in principle, you can go further and uh, say, let's, for example, uh, we, we now know that there are these groups uh, in, 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 uh, in part F and let's put them into the model. And, and see what what what's what happens if we filter them out as well. Yeah. And that is what you are meaning by by uh, iterating. So the this is a ground out. truth in the middle. Yeah. So I don't like this alluvial diagrams, but uh, so mm -hmm. my collaborators like. Them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so the middle part is almost the most important in the alluvial diagram, namely. So this is what people tell. Yeah. So they have asked. Uh, about so who are your friends, what mm -hmm. class membership, and so mm -hmm. forth. And then based on this information, one can calculate communities that look like this. Mm -hmm. and there from this ground truth in the middle, you see there are more than three of these communities. Yeah? Yes. So this is from the ground truth. Mm -hmm. The question is how much of this information about this uh, relation between the people can you take into account? And what we can do with this ensemble is we can repeated information take into account. Mm -hmm. So what other network model cannot do. And mm -hmm. this means that then by using this additional information mm -hmm. and the class membership, we get to this more refined picture. Whereas if we only go with the- What, 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 what do you mean by using <clears throat> additional information? What exactly you do to use it? Um, I do this. That's the slide. Okay, so I'm trying, okay perfect. I'm trying to get to this omega. So that's yes. a challenge. So the omega says, okay, well, how much how much is our relation bias? Right? So is there anything special, for example, father and mother, or these type of things? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So or we are, we are friends, we are belonging to the same class, and this type. And this is reflected in the omega. The omega is a uh, it's the odds ratio of the two of us interacting and where, those, where, where the two of where, us where, uh, that, is, that is what I don't understand. Where Omega comes from? You have external information which yeah. which, which you put into Omega, yes, which correct. is which is not in the in the in the in the network. It it, it is external sort, sort of metadata which which yeah. So this okay. is this is <clears throat> described in uh, this uh, term network regression, yeah, multi-layer network. So, regression. for example, if 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 uh, uh, can you describe the procedure? For example, we have. Oh, we can this, use this. Uh, this uh, we can uh, use this. This, uh, this uh, knowledge that, for example, for yeah. for these guys who are uh, writing each other letters during the yeah. reformation, that they have. I don't know, 30 years age difference and leave one in Munich yeah. and another in Berlin. Yeah. What, what should I do to get Omega? Yeah, okay, good. So let's look into this graph from Jonah here. So we have three layers here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one is our interaction layer. So that means not only 
that we have a link, but also you see there are like here, you see there's four or five links. So that means I also yeah, consider so, 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 how so, many repeated interactions I okay, have. Yeah. Okay. So this is one input. Then the next layer has another input. These are our class memberships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for example, so mm -hmm. these two are in one class, the green one is another class, and mm -hmm. so forth. So this is information that I have available. And then I use the different layers to predict this one, the friendship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I try to figure out. Uh, what is the friend? Uh, can I predict whether two people have a friendship relation or not? So mm -hmm. the fact that we go to the same class does not mean that we are friends. The mm -hmm. fact that we interact a lot also doesn't mean that we are mm -hmm. friends. So we could do a project together, this type of things, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then I try to predict uh, the friendship link. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, this is done in this network regression procedure. So that means in the omega, I have an expression of how much uh, the two of us are basically biased in, in their relation yeah? based on this information. Mm -hmm. You can look uh, up the R package by Jonah or all the, the papers. Uh, oh, by the way, there's a very good paper by Christian Singh um, and who, so who makes it very didactical with the omega. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and and uh, we have so psi is the overall number of connections between classes. Yeah. Ah, okay. Then, then, then more. No, than but not between classes, between people in class. I and J are the individuals. Mm -hmm. so my proposal is so. We yeah, can yeah. take a look at the paper. So, yeah, yeah. It's, okay, okay. so it's not a trivial thing. Then I have a second question. We go, we, we go, we, we're out of time. We go to lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, but Viuna is in a different country and yes. may want to ask a question. Okay, so good. let's give her the last question. Mm -hmm. Brief, please. Uh, yes, no, thanks very much. I think we touched upon it a little bit. But um, it was a question about the second half of the talk where you speak about comparing uh, the exist the network at hand uh, with the ensemble of all possible networks. Yeah. And then always you were saying that we generate this ensemble of possible networks uh, based on some constraints that we impose. And I was yeah. just wondering, what are these constraints and how would that be implemented? So we come back to the example we just discussed. The constraints are, for example, additional information about the class membership. Yeah. So in this case, so and this is reflected then in this omega. Yeah. So for example, so if I have other information available, we are born in the same town, for example, or we have the same type of friends. Yeah. Or these type of things. If I have this information available, I can use this to constrain my network ensemble. So that means I generate less and less random links. Why? Because I know more and more about our relation. That's, uh, that's the meaning of it. Yeah. So and eventually, I know that much so that I have almost no random uh, interactions and a full model that describes the whole social relation between these people. I mean, we will never end up there, but that's a that's a way of thinking. Yeah, so, yeah, good. Thank you very much. So we're at the end of a two-hour um, session, and so the cultural data analytics open lab seminar uh, here in Tallinn will return in fall uh, around September one until December. Um, and we have the cultural science journal running. So if you are uh, interested producing papers in this direction, please consider that journal. And we all hope we will be there uh, in fall and um, uh, peace will fall on the world and we will not be in a pandemic anymore. So thank you very much. Um, see you in fall. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.